Hello and welcome back. In the previous video, I stated that temperature actually describes the tendency for an object to give or receive heat. As a result, direct measurements of temperature are fairly difficult. Fortunately, it turns out that there are many phenomena that depend on the temperature of an object. As a result, by studying these phenomena and measuring related variable, we can create indirect ways to measure the temperature of an object. One such phenomenon is called thermal expansion. So it turns out that when the temperature of most objects increase, the length of the object increases as well. This effect is usually too small to be seen, however there are several common examples that I want to talk about. The first is an old-fashioned liquid thermometer. So inside one of these liquid thermometers, there is a ball full of liquid, and then just above this is a very narrow tube. So when you place this type of thermometer under somebody's tongue or inside a pool of water, the liquid inside the thermometer increases so that it is equal to its surroundings. And when this happens, the liquid inside the thermometer expands due to thermal expansion. And because the tube of the thermometer is so narrow, when the liquid expands by even a small amount, it creates a noticeable change that we can see. Another common example is in very large structures such as bridges. So if you've ever driven over a very large bridge, you've noticed these sawtooth metal sections. And what these actually are, are they are gaps inside the bridge. So there is actually a disconnected section. Those two sections are actually disconnected. And the reason that these gaps exist is so that on a hot day, when the bridge expands, the, the bridge has room to expand so that the two ends of the bridge don't run into each other and buckle. This can also be seen with sidewalks. I've actually seen sidewalks buckle on the uh, campus here at the University of Virginia. So if you've ever seen a sidewalk, you notice that sidewalks are actually created from separate pieces of cement, and they're placed with a small gap between them. And the reason that sidewalks are built like this is so that on a hot day, these separate slabs, when they expand due to thermal expansion, they have room to expand. They're not going to run into each other and buckle. Now another example, the last example I want to talk about, is uh, the metal lid on a jar. You've probably heard this before, that if you have a metal lid on a jar and it's really tight, it's hard to, to remove. If you take the jar and you run hot water over it, it's easier to remove the lid. And the reason this happens is because of thermal expansion. So it turns out that metal lids, they expand slightly more than the glass jar when the temperature increases. So that's why it makes it easier to remove the lid. So how do we describe thermal expansion? Well, it turns out that the fractional change in the length of an object is proportional to the temperature. So the fractional change, what do I mean by that? I mean the change in the object's length divided by the initial length of the object. And that's going to be equal to this constant, which is called a coefficient of linear thermal expansion times the change in the temperature of an object. So this number here, this alpha, this is actually a property of a material. So every material has a coefficient of linear thermal expansion. Now, I want to just briefly talk about why it's the fractional length that we're interested in. So let me go ahead and open up a blank screen here. And let's look at a simple example. Suppose I have a meter stick, and this meter stick is exactly one meter long when the temperature is equal to zero degrees Celsius. And now if I heat up this meter stick, so let's say I dip the meter stick inside uh, boiling water, so I heat up the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius. Because of thermal expansion, this meter stick will increase in length. So the length of the meter stick might be, let's say, one meter plus one millimeter. So the length of the meter stick has increased by one millimeter because I've heated it up by 100 degrees Celsius. Now let's suppose we have something that's twice as long. And for simplicity, let's just suppose I take two meter sticks and I place them side by side. So obviously when I place two meter sticks side by side, when the temperature is zero degrees Celsius, this is just going to be two meters because each meter stick is one meter long. Now when I heat the whole thing up to 100 degrees Celsius, if we think about this, each one of the meter sticks is going to become one millimeter longer. So as a result, the total length of these two meter sticks placed side by side when they're 100 degrees Celsius is going to be 2 meters plus 2 millimeters. However, the ratio 
of this change in length divided by the initial length is the same for both of them. So if I take one millimeter and divide it by a meter, that's one one thousandth. If I take two millimeters and divide it by two meters, that's still one one thousandth. Okay? So this is why we talk about the fractional change in the length of an object when we're discussing thermal expansion. So I want to go ahead and look at the units of this linear thermal expansion. So let's go ahead and look at this uh, equation we have here. It is the change in the length divided by the initial length is equal to the linear thermal expansion times the change in temperature. So again, just applying dimensional analysis, the units on the left side have to be equal to the units on the right side. So here we have the units on the left side, the units on the right side. So if we think about what we have here on the left, this is the change in the length of an object divided by the length of the object. So these are both lengths. So I'm taking a length and dividing it by a length. So what I'm left with is something that's unitless. And this has to be equal to the units of alpha times the units of temperature. So from this, we can see that the units of alpha have to be equal to one divided by the units of temperature. So usually we'll measure alpha in terms of uh, inverse degrees Celsius. So a lot of times I'll write it like this. I'll say alpha is you know, some number times degrees Celsius raised to the minus one power. So I want to talk about one very important example of thermal expansion, and this is shrink fitting. So shrink fitting is a common uh, method that's used by engineers to connect two objects together. And to understand how shrink fitting works, we first need to understand what happens to a hole inside an object when that object expands due to thermal expansion. So what I have shown here is a sort of donut shape that's made out of uh, eight square blocks. And the center block here is removed. So the question is, is what's going to happen to the size of this block, this missing uh, block here, when the whole thing expands due to thermal expansion? And your first thought might be, well, if all of this metal is going to expand, it's going to close up that hole, and the hole's going to get smaller. But in reality, it's actually sort of the opposite thing that happens. So each one of these individual blocks expands due to thermal expansion. So as a result, the missing hole on the inside here will actually increase in size. And it turns out that the linear thermal expansion coefficient for this hole is equal to the linear thermal expansion coefficient for the material that the hole is made out of. So the basic idea behind uh, shrink fitting is that you take some type of object, and if you want to say, let's say I wanted to attach a rod to this, you would drill out a hole inside the original object, and then you create a rod that is slightly too large to fit inside the hole. So you actually machine this out so the rod here is too big to fit inside the hole. And then typically what you do is you would take this, instead of trying to heat up the hole, so I could heat up the hole and make the hole bigger, and then put the rod inside that. But typically what you do is you take the small, or you take the object that's too large and you typically just dunk it in liquid nitrogen. So if I take this and I put it in liquid nitrogen, this whole thing's going to shrink due to thermal expansion. So this whole rod will become smaller so that it can fit inside the hole. Then once I place the rod inside the hole and the whole thing returns back to room temperature, this rod will expand and then it'll be a real nice tight fit inside there. And if we think about what's actually going on when you use uh, shrink fitting, the force that actually holds the rod in place once it's finally in there is the frictional force between the inside surface of this hole and the outer surface of the rod. So what's happening is that when this rod expands, the force that the uh, inside surface of this hole is exerting back on the rod is this immense force, right? The rod and the inside surface of this hole are exerting very large forces on each other. And that's going to be a normal force that is exerted between the two of them. So this frictional force, right, remember, is mu times the normal force. And because this is going to be so large, this frictional force that's holding that rod in place will be an extremely large force. So that's why uh, shrink fitting works so well. Now let's go ahead and look at a couple of examples. The first example says, a coin has a diameter of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. 
When the temperature of the coin is raised by 75 degrees Celsius, the diameter increases by 2.3 times 10 to the minus 5 meters. And the question asks us to determine the thermal expansion coefficient for the coin. <clears throat> so here's the information that was given to us. This is the initial diameter of the coin. This is how much the diameter changes. And this is the change in the temperature. So recall that the formula that describes linear thermal expansion is delta L divided by the initial length is equal to the thermal expansion coefficient times the change in the temperature. So since I know everything but the thermal expansion coefficient, this example is pretty straightforward. So if I just solve for alpha, I see alpha is equal to delta L divided by uh, delta T times L naught. And if I plug all the numbers that I have into here, I see that this is equal to 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5 inverse degrees Celsius. And this is actually a pretty typical value for thermal expansion. So it turns out thermal expansion, as you can see, it's a very small effect, right? 10 to the minus 5. So this is a, a very small effect. The next example says, a simple pendulum is used to keep time. It consists of a ball attached by a thin brass wire. And the thermal expansion for the wire is 16 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degrees Celsius. The period of the pendulum is initially 2 seconds. Determine the period of the pendulum when the temperature of the pendulum is increased by 140 degrees Celsius. So the idea behind this is that the, pen, the period of a pendulum depends on the length of the string. So when the temperature increases, the length of the string will increase due to thermal expansion. And when this happens, it'll change the period of the pendulum, making it longer. So let's go ahead and open up a blank screen here. And let me write down what we were given. So we were told that the thermal expansion coefficient is 16 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degrees Celsius. So I'll write this as 1 over degrees Celsius. We're told the change in temperature is going to be 140 degrees Celsius. And we're also told that the initial period is equal to 2 seconds. And I'm going to use a P here to describe the period. That way it doesn't get confused with the temperature. Normally we would use T to describe period, but here we have T is already being used for temperature. And what I'm asked to solve for is this final period. So one way we could do this is we could use the period to figure out the initial length and then solve for the final length using the thermal expansion equation and then finally solve for the final period. However, there is an easier way to solve this problem using proportions. So the first thing I want to do is I want to look at how the period depends on the length of the string. So recall that the angular frequency of a pendulum is equal to the square root of g divided by l. And angular frequency itself is equal to 2 pi divided by the period. So if I want to solve for the period, so I'm going to multiply the period over here. I'm going to divide both sides by the square root of g over l. I see that the period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of l divided by g. So if I take the if I take the ratio of the final period with the initial period, actually I should be using p here, I guess. So if I take the final period divided by the initial period, so I'm going to have 2 pi times the square root of the final length divided by g, divided by 2 pi times the square root of the initial length divided by g. So when I do this, the 2 pi's cancel and the square roots of g cancel. So I can see that the ratio of the periods is just going to go like the square root of the final length divided by the initial length. And the final length is just going to be the initial length plus delta L. So we'll have that the ratio of the periods is equal to L naught plus delta L divided by L naught and then the square root of all of that. So now what I can do is I can use the formula for thermal expansion to figure out what delta L is, and then I can plug that into this formula here to solve for the final period. So remember that the formula for thermal expansion is delta L divided by L naught is equal to alpha times delta T. So delta L is equal to alpha L naught delta T. So if I take this and I plug it into this formula down here, I can see that the final period is equal to the initial period times the square root of, so it's going to be L 
plus delta L, I'm sorry, L naught plus delta L, and delta L is this, so it's L naught plus alpha L naught over delta T divided by the initial length. So the nice thing about this is that initial length eventually just divides out. So we see that this is equal to the initial period times the square root of one plus alpha times delta t. And if I plug all this into a calculator, I'll see that the final period is gonna be equal to 2.0027 seconds. So the initial period was two seconds and the final period is basically still two seconds. However, you can imagine if we were using this to measure time, if this was a clock, what this means is that after a thousand uh, little ticks of the clock, after a thousand oscillations, this thing's gonna be off by 2.7 seconds. So gradually over time, uh, a clock that's using a pendulum to measure time will become off. So obviously, if the length of an object increases as its temperature increases, then the volume of the object will also increase as the temperature increases. And it turns out the formula that describes the change in the volume of an object is very similar to the formula that describes the change in the length of the object. So we have here that the fractional change in the volume of the object is equal to something called the volumetric thermal expansion times the change in the temperature. And it turns out that the volumetric thermal expansion is very closely related to the linear thermal expansion. In fact, the volumetric thermal expansion is always equal to three times the linear thermal expansion. And I want to just go ahead and describe where it is that this comes from, why those two things are always related. I should warn you that this will require a little bit of calculus, so if you're not familiar with calculus, you know, feel free to skip over this part of the video. So the formula that describes linear thermal expansion is delta L divided by L naught is equal to the linear thermal expansion coefficient times delta T. So if I solve for alpha, I see that alpha is equal to one over L naught times delta L divided by delta T. And another way I could write this is I could say this is one over L naught times the derivative of the length with respect to temperature, right? This is the rate that the length changes with respect to temperature. Similarly, the volumetric thermal expansion is gonna be one over the initial volume times the derivative of the volume with respect to temperature. And if we think about volume, volume is always proportional to the length cubed. So the formula for volume is always gonna be some constant times the cube of the length. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna to try to take the derivative of this volume with respect to temperature. So I'm gonna take the derivative of volume with respect to temperature. And we have to be a little bit careful about this, okay? So this is the derivative with respect to temperature of A L cubed. And the reason we have to be careful is that the length changes as the temperature increases. So what this is, let me go ahead and write this explicitly. This is a, form, this is a function of the temperature, okay? So when I evaluate this derivative, I have to use the chain rule. So what we're gonna get is, so remember, when we take the chain rule, the first thing you do is you take the derivative with respect to the function, so this is gonna be 3a times the initial length squared, and then I have to multiply this by the derivative of this, so times the derivative of the length with respect to temperature. And then the trick is, is that the derivative of the length with respect to temperature, if I go back up to this equation right here, we can see that this derivative is equal to the initial length times alpha. So I can write this as alpha times L naught. So if I do that, I see that this is 3A times L naught squared times alpha L naught. Or in other words, this is three alpha times uh, A L naught cubed. And since the volume is A L cubed, this is three alpha times V naught. So the derivative of the volume with respect to temperature is three alpha times the initial volume. So what this means is that the beta, which remember is equal to one over the initial volume times the derivative of volume with respect to temperature is gonna be equal to this divided by the initial volume. So we can see that this will be equal to three times the linear thermal expansion. So this is where that relationship comes from. It really comes because the volume depends on the length cubed, and when we take that derivative, 
right? Because we're interested in how the volume changes with respect to temperature. So that three is gonna come down and then we'll take the derivative of the length because of the chain rule. But that's where it comes from, is because that three comes down when you take the derivative. So let's go ahead and look at an example that uses this volumetric thermal expansion. So this example says a 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3 cubic meter glass mug is filled to the brim with coffee. The volumetric thermal expansion coefficient for the glass and the coffee are given below. So we have the volumetric thermal expansion for the mug is 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degrees Celsius. And the volumetric expansion coefficient for the coffee is 207 times 10 to the minus 6 degrees Celsius, inverse degrees Celsius. And the question asks us to determine how much coffee will spill from the mug when the temperature of both the mug and coffee are increased by 72 degrees Celsius. So the idea is that because the thermal expansion coefficient for the coffee is greater than the thermal expansion coefficient for the mug, the coffee will expand by more than the mug does, and as a result, some of the coffee will spill. So if we think about this, well, let me first write down what was given to us. So the initial volume is equal to 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters. And the change in temperature is 72 degrees Celsius. And the thermal expansion coefficient for the mug is 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degrees Celsius. And the thermal expansion coefficient for the coffee is 207 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degrees Celsius. So if we think about this, the amount of coffee that'll spill from the mug is equal to the difference in the amount of, that the volume of the coffee changes and the amount that the volume of the cup or the mug changes. So the volume of the coffee that spills is equal to the amount that the volume of the coffee increases by minus the amount that the volume that the mug increases by. So all we need to do now is plug in the formula for delta V. So this is going to be equal to the initial volume of the coffee times the thermal expansion coefficient for the coffee times delta T, and the amount that the volume of the mug changes by is equal to V naught times the thermal expansion coefficient for the mug times delta T. And because these initial volumes will be the same, and because the delta T's will be the same, I can just write this as V naught times the thermal expansion coefficient for the coffee minus the thermal expansion coefficient for the mug times delta T. And finally, if I plug all the numbers that was given to me into this formula, I see that this will be equal to 7.29 times 10 to the minus 6 cubic meters. So actually, this is probably such a small amount that the coffee evaporating will probably be more than the amount that would spill out due to thermal expansion. So at this point, I think I'd like to end that video. And in the next video, I want to talk about heat. So I'll talk about things like specific heat and latent heat, and we'll also talk about thermodynamic equilibrium.